Hi folks, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Hello everyone. Hi. <laughs> thanks for joining us. We'll just wait another few seconds to let folk come on in. And then we will make a start. Okay, well, I think we've got most people here. Well, good evening, folks, and a very warm welcome to the final Nature Trek Roadshow of the series. I'm Sarah Frost, Nature Trek's Marketing Manager. I'll be your host for this evening, and it's lovely to have you all here joining us for our final night. We've been running these presentations weekly since the 5th of October last year, and it's been a tremendous success. So I'd just like to thank all of you for sharing this journey with us once again. We've really enjoyed your company over the last two winters since we started these. And this season of presentations has seen 40 individual speakers join us from all corners of the globe, some of them getting up in the middle of the night over in their overseas locations just to join us. And we've covered over a hundred different destinations. And it's really lovely to feel such a warm sense of camaraderie and the online community that has been created with these presentations. And we'll be closing the series this evening on my favorite topic, that is the wildlife cruises. Although I'm based in the office as our marketing manager, I specialize in leading our cruises around the world. I've just got back from leading our Baja cruise last week, which was quite simply outstanding standing and has well and truly ruined whale watching for me anywhere else in the world because it was just fantastic and for those of you who aren't familiar with nature trek cruises almost all of them are private charters which means that we have total control over the vessel we fill it with like-minded wildlife enthusiasts we crew it with an expert naturalist guide and importantly they depart at the right time of year for the wildlife Furthermore, they're small boat charters. The word cruise often connotates images of a huge cruise liner with 2000 passengers on board. Well, not on a nature trek cruise. We take about 15 people, depending on the size of the, size of the vessel. Our polar cruises take more 50 to 100, but typically we're looking at around 15 passengers. So you get a much more intimate experience and exclusive experience. And tonight we're going from temperate habitats to the tropics as we journey to Canada, Brazil, Indonesia and the Solomon Islands. And joining me to take us on this evening of wildlife travel are the wonderful Ed Druitt, a long-standing tour leader joining us from his home in the Forest of Dean. And also operations manager Tom Mabbitt joining us from his home in Gloucestershire. So just a reminder, you can pop your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We're very happy to answer all of these throughout the evening and we'll have a proper uh, chat over questions at the very end of the evening after the last presentation has finished just after nine o'clock. So folks, for the last time this season, I'll say, I hope you're sitting comfortably with a drink and some nibbles and enjoy relaxing in the company of our expert naturalists as we take you on a virtual journey around the world. So without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Ed, who's going to start our evening by taking us over to Canada. Over to you, Ed. Thank you, Sarah, and um, welcome everybody. It's great to sort of virtually be in touch with you all really after a few years of, of not being away. And like Sarah, I love doing these, the wildlife cruises because you just, even though you might have a particular focus, um, you just see such a wealth of other wildlife. And as Sarah said, I've been with Nature Trek now for a while, uh, doing both the poles in Antarctica and Arctica and lots of fabulous places in between. But very much before COVID hit, uh, back in September 2019, I had the fabulous privilege and opportunity to take uh, a wonderful group of uh, nature trekkers to um, Canada, to the West Coast, uh, on the Spirit Bears, Grizzlies and Humpbacks trip. And that's what I'm going to explore with you um, this evening, really. And uh, hopefully looking for the Spirit Bear, which is this kind of white version of the Black Bear. So, as I say, we travelled kind of all the way across Canada. We started off down here near Vancouver and we went in a propeller plane all the way uh, along the west coast to a place called Bella Bella. And just that journey in its own right was wonderful. It was a small little plane. You can sort of feel every little, 
movement of the plane, but actually looking out, you just get to see and get to really appreciate the kind of landscape. And what we did was we spent uh, about 10 days or so on this uh, on a boat, which I'll show you in a moment. And we were going all the way around the Great Bear Rainforest, which is around about the size of Ireland. Obviously, we were just sort of um, touching into just parts of that, but very much kind of going in amongst all these different islands and then sometimes creeping out to the um, to the open sea a little bit. And we went all the way up north to uh, Kitimat, which is uh, up here not that far really towards Alaska in the background and then we flew back home after that and this was the boat that we were on it was the island Roma and it was a little bit like the sort of the doctor's TARDIS really where from the outside it doesn't look too big as a clipper boat but actually on the inside um, there's plenty of space for us to socialize um, rooms uh, kind of kind of small uh, bunk beds to to sleep in or, or slightly more open uh, set rooms for, for couples um, and then of course plenty of space actually on the deck and we went very much um, out and about looking at this wonderful wilderness um, rainforest on zodiac boats we had a couple of these which uh, trailed along behind the boat and we very much used it as a kind of hide as well. So this is when we were out sort of watching um, whales and uh, dolls, porpoises and orcas and all sorts of things like that. And as I say, the wonderful thing about doing these types of um, cruises really is just the fact that there's a whole wealth of wildlife, both what's in the water, what's going overhead and what's in the surrounding landscape as well. And the wonderful thing about being on this boat was we were able to be quite durable in terms of doing different things. And here's us actually going towards and experiencing a wonderful waterfall that was coming down from one of the, uh, the cliffs, the limestone cliffs that was in the area that we were there. And obviously being in a rainforest, you do get the rain. And certainly, uh, despite the fact that they'd had quite a few weeks of dry weather, uh, during the period that we were there, certainly the first uh, days or so was quite wet. So here's some of the group just going out um, in the waterproofs, really. But we had some brilliant guides with us. Um, and I think that what is always important, and, I, and I'm the same here when I take people out in the Forest of Dean or wherever I go taking nature trek out, is that you you wanted to sort of almost see the animals and leave the animals without having changed their behaviour. And the great thing about going on these Zodiac boats with the with the crew that we had was that there's great knowledge and great experience of the distances you can approach animals with, uh, the way in which you can come at them and still see them, but without disturbing them. And that's the really crucial thing. And so each day we were going out in different locations. And this, for example, was in the first couple of days, surrounded by all these conifer trees and at this point in time, in kind of mid-September, you've got all different species of salmon, which are basically coming into spawn and then dying. And all that protein, all that fat food is there on the beaches. And so you get lots of goals. And if you're lucky, you also get the bears as well. And in the first couple of days, we weren't seeing bears to start with, but we were certainly seeing lots of signs of them and lots of signs of their food. So here we also got the chance to go on land on a number of different days and we were actually seeing the live salmon fish in the river here and what I think was great about this was getting a really nice understanding of the ecosystem of the habitats and getting a real feel of you know the salmon's environment the bear's environment and of course a lot of the birds and other wildlife that were living there as well and I must add that during the course of this holiday there was also time out in places as well we were able to go to like a little sort of rustic kind of uh, forest kind of spa that was kind of just on the on the edge of the woodland on the rocks and we were able to go and do a little bit of canoeing either by ourselves for a little bit of sort of mindful uh, relaxation just around these lovely calm waters or for those that maybe weren't so confident or 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 weren't so used to using the oars, then some of the crew were able to join us as well and just experience the sounds and the calm water and, and get away from, from the kind of the bigger boat during that period. And this is some of the fabulous scenery that we were seeing uh, throughout the journey, really. This was one, the first couple of days when we still had quite low cloud. And uh, these are Bonaparte's goals, which are kind of trickling down through the valley, again, on the lookout for different food. And it's just just so atmospheric, really, really lovely. Just us out there with no one else around and the wonderful sights and sounds and and just experiencing the kind of the weather and this this temperate rainforest in British Columbia. 
And uh, sometimes seeing some familiar birds, this is actually a mugol or common goal, but I think it's a, it's a slightly different subspecies than what we get actually in the UK. And the water below this mugol was beautifully clear. You could see sea urchins, you could see the rocks and the seaweeds below. It was just utterly beautiful, clear weather. And here's another lovely scenic view um, looking up towards the, the hills, the water running down the limestone uh, creeks up there, the coniferous trees, and just the atmosphere and the sound and the smell as well of all the fish um, that had obviously been washed up on the shore. And here's another view of just some fantastic kind of lichens and mosses, and there was all sorts of wonderful fungi. I even got to see some bird's nest fungi, which I've always wanted to see. And uh, when we were on land, there was this lovely log, and suddenly these little kind of little bird nest fungi with the little, uh, what looked like the eggs, which are kind of the spore capsules, which was really rather wonderful. And even in the rain, there are still lots of birds to see, for example. Here we've got a, a bald eagle looking a little bit bedraggled. And in the first couple of days, we did see a sea otter, we saw redneck grebes, we saw um, sort of different kind of migratory water birds all around actually. And of course the, the bald eagles are very much being attracted to the, to the fish and the food that, that's around at this time of the year. And uh, I was very pleased about seeing these actually, these are wild Canada geese. And of course in Britain, we get used to seeing the kind of feral populations of them, but these were some wild Canada geese flying through the valley. And you can see they actually look a lot dusky, a lot darker. And I love this picture here of the, uh, the atmosphere as these geese kind of came out of the, the mist that was actually uh, uh, surrounding the, the landscape uh, on this particular day. But of course, what's important is, is having that opportunity to see the wildlife and in particular see the bears. And here we are on the Zodiac boats being very carefully pushed. At this point, the engines were off and the guides were very carefully just pushing us into position. You can see the goals are here on the shoreline. And sure enough, uh, finally, after a couple of days or so, we got our first sightings of our um, grizzly bears or our brown bears. So these are the the same sort of species that you would see uh, across Europe. And here we've got mum uh, with her cubs that are about 18 months old here. And you can see all the goals. Most of these are kind of glaucous wing goals, um, just hanging around really looking for those kind of uh, tidbits of food. And the young bears here were, were, were very much tumbling along with mum as they were looking for different fish. And uh, this is exactly what they were doing here. I think in the next picture, we can see that mum's actually got uh, a salmon here and the young cubs were coming over to have a feed with her. And you can see that in the Zodiac boats, we were very level with these bears. It was great for photography because we weren't looking down on them. We were looking sort of level with them. And as I say, these bears very much stayed, you know, keeping their very natural behaviour and when we left these bears, we just were able to be sort of pulled backwards that the guys were kind of in the water in their in their in, in their waders, basically, and very much got us further away from the bears before the, the engines were started. So the first couple of days were certainly quite wet and we had some fabulous, we had a fabulous chef on board the boat. So whenever we got back onto the boat and our clothes were put down in the engine room to dry off, we just had some just really good kind of home cooked type food, but it was delicious, it was colorful, and the chef was really good at providing food for, for all sorts of different diets and, and, and for different kind of, um, you know, food habits really. And, and, and yeah, it was just so tasty, it was great. And everyone kind of uh, mucked in with kind of helping to sort of, uh, you know, dry up afterwards and talk to the chef and, and make him feel involved as well. It was really, really fabulous and obviously welcome when you were coming back on board from after being out uh, watching the bears. So again, just, you know, all the time being surrounded by this amazing landscape, you can just see a few salmon here that have been washed up on the shore. But yeah, just just beautiful kind of landscape all the way around. And the wonderful thing, of course, is that the water in many places is actually quite deep. The waters are very calm because we're well away from the open ocean in many of these particular parts of the um, Great Bear Rainforest. And on this particular morning, we woke up, uh, we'd seen a couple of kind of coastal walls actually just on the in the bay that we'd been overnighting in. And as we were coming out to carry along our journey, we suddenly heard and saw these fantastic spouts of two fin whales um, that were basically just guiding the way along the coastline. And you can just see the fabulous mist of the breath there of this particular fin whale. 
and you know and you just never quite know it feels quite surreal that you're not out usually when I've seen fin whales you know I've been out on the sea and actually to see them in these wonderful kind of almost fjord like uh, habitats was really rather wonderful and actually in a lot of these more shallow uh, confined areas it was often a good place for seeing perhaps much smaller younger humpback whales and again uh, you know these these animals choosing to be near us as opposed to us kind of chasing after them or us getting close to them so this particular humpback whale here again choosing to be sort of close by giving us these amazing views of its blowhole um, before then actually giving us that that wonderful ultimate shot of the uh, humpback whale then then diving underwater and the waters here in September are very rich uh, there's lots of food under the sea, under the water. And, and actually what you're finding in some of these kind of quieter watery areas are, as I say, single or maybe a few younger whales. And we saw one or two of them kind of practicing uh, doing bubble netting. So I'll show you a photograph in a minute of a much bigger group of humpback whales doing this. But we saw one or two kind of younger, smaller animals almost practicing this by themselves. I remember uh, in one particular kind of almost the equivalent of a lock, um, uh, suddenly seeing this youngish kind of humpback whale going underwater uh, and creating these bubbles and then coming up with its mouth uh, gulping open and no doubt getting some food I'm sure but it was it was really interesting kind of seeing this this behavior on a kind of small scale before we, we saw it much bigger uh, later on and I think one of the real treats we we had every day was you never as as anything when you do all these cruises you never know quite what you're going to see and on a number of days, we saw dolls, porpoises. These are not dolls, porpoises. These are orcas or killer whales. Um, but dolls, porpoises are these super speedy uh, porpoises that are black and white, really kind of zooming around. But actually, on the days when there's no, when there's when there's when there's none of those around, it often means there's, there might well be a predator like the orca, because orcas will eat uh, dolls, porpoises, for example. And at the start of the cruise and towards the end, we encountered, I think, probably the same school the same pod of uh, orcas um but again the animals very relaxed coming past the boat just i think on the first time you saw them they were very much in kind of transporting mode they were very much going from a to b but when we saw them the last time they were very much kind of feeding so they were disappearing underwater for quite a while then coming back up again and, and often coming quite close to the boat um, and on this animal, actually, you can see the sort of slightly yellow stained white skin, and that's diatoms, these microscopic organisms that grow in the water, grow on the mud, uh, and actually are really important um, for capturing kind of carbon and photosynthesizing and, and, and putting oxygen back into the water. And often they'll grow on the skin of the, the humpbacks and uh, sorry, on the orcas. And you see this particularly actually when you're in the southern hemisphere in places such as um, Antarctica more. But look at that big tall dorsal fin of, of the male um, orca there just on the right. And uh, here he is actually sort of just coming past the boat. It looks like he's almost coming towards the boat. He's not. He was actually just sort of swimming past. And we just got this wonderful photograph um, of him as he was uh, swimming past. I mean, just just incredible. We spent probably about an hour with these animals. And as I say, they were very relaxed. They were choosing to be around us. And wow, what a, what a way to finish the, the cruise. It was really quite remarkable. Other mammals that we saw included the stellar sea lions. Um, this was uh, more towards the north along the coast areas. And uh, here we were at this kind of sea lion rookery and uh, many of them in the water as well, actually all around the boat, which was really fun to see. And on this particular occasion, just before we kind of got finally to some of the rest of the bears, which I'll talk about in a moment, goals are really important, actually, particularly when you're wanting to watch the whales. This was a Thayer's goal, but we also had lots of glaucous wing goals, which were also a very big kind of herring goal sized bird, but with much more grey or whiter wings. And when the goals suddenly become restless and they start flying above the water, um, calling, you know that there's going to be an event with the whales. And on many occasions, on one particular day, we saw this. We saw some wonderful bubble netting where I just mentioned it a little bit with the smaller individuals. But on this particular day, there were big adult humpback whales feeding cooperatively. 
diving down underwater, forming this, what we call this bubble net, which is kind of crowling and scaring the fish into one area. And then the humpbacks all come up at the same time with their mouths open and then gulping in all the water and the krill and the fish or whatever might be there and allowing that water to filter out and then obviously swallowing down all that all that food and meanwhile all of those Glaucus wing gulls and those Thayer's gulls flying around picking out some of those bits of food that might have escaped it, it really is an incredible spectacle and up to this point I'd seen it you know on Dave Attenborough films I'd, I'd seen it on I think Trials of Life back when I was little as well but to see it for real was really really remarkable and we kept seeing it throughout the day and even at one point having the animals come up very close to the boat actually because you, you see them go under you watch them go under you know they're going to do it but you can never always be quite sure until the goals start crying exactly where the animals are going to come but but really really amazing to, to see and memorable as well and then finally as we were coming towards the end of our tour we were going back inland around these wonderful little islands seeing this this incredible kind of scenery and on the last day before we headed back to Kitimat, we spent a day pretty much, six or seven hours, by a wonderful river uh, on Gribble Island, where we wanted to be looking for the spirit bear, these white bears, which are black bears. And we were very safe in this, this, this hide here. We'd taken our kind of um, you know, lunches with us and things like that. And if you look in the middle, in the background there, you'll see that there's actually uh, a mum... Uh, black bear here with her two cubs and I'll show you some closer photographs of them in a moment but while we were there watching uh, this river all day long with the sound of the running water we saw some other great things as well we had um, at least a couple of American dippers that were feeding all around us and coming quite close and there were Stella's jays which were coming down to the salmon eggs if you look just here where my cursor is you might be able to just see a uh, little almost look like frog spawn but these were the eggs of fish uh, of the salmon and the Stella's jays were coming down to, to feed on those. And then also things like woodpeckers. Here's a, a hairy woodpecker on a, on a dead tree here. But of course, what we were coming to see were the bears. And throughout that six or seven hour period, we saw lots and lots of different bears kind of coming and going, suddenly just appearing out of the woodland, coming into the water, finding a dead fish or perhaps one that was semi alive. And these fish, these salmon have come up the river to spawn. And then once they've done the spawning, um, they very much then die and uh, provide food for the bears. And when the bears drag the salmon into the forest, that, that takes nitrogen and phosphorus and all those nutrients back into the forest and allows for this kind of flow of nutrients in this amazing life cycle that happens there. Here's a couple of those youngsters that we saw um, a little bit earlier, just coming along and uh, learning very much from their mum and uh, mum looking for some of these dead fish. It's amazing how hard some of them are to grip and get hold of. And uh, you're watching the youngsters often learning from their mum when they were in the river. And here's actually some of the salmon. You can just see it. Some of them were still very well. Some of them were still coming up the river to spawn. Some of them were half dead and some of them were very dead. And so you got to see the whole uh, myriad really of different fishes, different salmon really in the river at different stages of their life cycle. And so there's mum and the cubs just relaxing. But again, you can see here that we're very much trying to be in the position where the animals are coming into their space and they're relaxed and we're not changing their behavior in any way. And here's one of those bears looking right at us after having munched on some salmon. And finally, um, a couple of times throughout the day, actually, but particularly towards the end of the day, we got a wonderful views of one particular spirit bear called Boss. And these spirit bears are in this particular part of British Columbia. They've got uh, some genes that, that give them this white hair rather than dark hair. And the kind of rusty colour around the neck is where this, 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 this bear, I think, has been probably rubbing against the tree. And this one has found some salmon. It was quite happy to be feeding on it. And throughout the, the time of the day there, we got particularly uh, good views of this spirit bear. It was coming close. And you can see all these bears are looking quite tubby, really. Uh, they're obviously feeling very well at this time of the year. They're putting on lots of weight, lots of fat to be able to get them through the winter time. And, and these fish, of course, have got lots of nutrients and lots of fatty acids uh, in their bodies for the bear um, to feed on. So you can just see the big paws, the big claws and the wonderful character of this particular spirit bear. There it is looking back at us. And the final shot here. Um, 
just showing you the landscape that we had from this hide. So these bears were just coming out from different directions, from the different vegetation and coming to feed. And the final shot really, before we headed back to the boat and the next day uh, sailed back into Kitty Mat was of the spirit bear there, just looking back at us in this wonderful wild environment of the great bear rainforest. So I hope that you've enjoyed just a quick um, visit to the Great Bear Rainforest and it's just shown you the wealth of wildlife that is there, the wealth of landscapes to see and the fact that you know you just never know what you're going to see with regards to things like the orcas. So I shall finish off there. Brilliant, thanks Ed. That looks super, I must get there myself one day. Um, brilliant, so um, I'm just going to share my screen with you everyone and uh, we will take you to Brazil. Great stuff, there we go. So you should be seeing my, my screen there. So um, yeah, welcome everyone again for this final final show of the uh, of, of the series. Uh, my name's Tom Abbott. I'm an operations manager for Nature Trek um, for nine years now. Back in March, 2013, I joined Nature Trek and um, I look after a whole range of different tours, including all our tours, all our holidays to Brazil. So I've got the task of fitting in the Amazon and the Pantanal into the next 20 minutes or just under 20 minutes now. So I'm gonna be going at a bit of a pace to get through. We run two superb cruises, um, one, one in the Amazon and, and in the Pantanal. Of course, we've got a whole range of other tours that cover the Pantanal, but I'm gonna be covering those, 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 those two cruises. So I'm just going to start in the Amazon and, uh, and, our, and our fabulous cruise there. And for this particular tour, we fly again, direct into Sao Paulo and then on to Manaus. And then from here, we're we're, we're, we're boarding the, the Irasima and we're traveling up the Rio Negro here to explore these two uh, fabulous national parks, the Anapanas National Park and the Zhao uh, National Park here. So we're, we're traveling uh, you know, away into the, you know, in, into the heart of the Amazon and, and just a, um, a, a brilliant place to, to explore. Um, this, is the, this is the Irasima, um, a 30 meter long um, houseboat, which will be our um, our, our home for the for the seven night uh, cruise, and it's a, she's she's a lovely size. We can moor up where we want. We can we can follow the wildlife. We can you know, obviously we're um, as Sarah explained at the start. We're chartering, so it's only a nature trek group, of course. So we can we can pick and choose our route. We can react to sightings um, and any 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 tip offs, and uh, um, it's a, a really comfortable um, comfortable vessel. A couple of photos here of the uh, of the rooms. Um, spacious uh, rooms there and a, and a really nice sort of dining area to sit and, and discuss sightings in the evening and, and make plans for the, um, for the for the days ahead. So as we start our cruise we, we, we come to the, the the meeting of the waters here so we have the the, the Rio Solimos on the right the, it's quite a you know the pale colour and then on the left the the, the Rio Negro much darker um, as, the, as the name would suggest and it's heading up the, um, the the Rio Negro that we is, is the course we take as we head towards um, the two national parks to explore there with with daily outing searching for just an incredible um, diversity and uh, of wildlife um, of all kinds really so it's a it's a vast sort of archipelago of, of over 400 islands the 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 Anabalanas, uh, national park um, one of the sort of largest freshwater national parks um, on, on the planet and we'll be ex you know exploring the area um, with, with 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 outings on smaller on smaller vessels, of course, as well um, as on the as on the Irasima. So this is a, a shot of a group enjoying just heading out on some dugout canoes with with, with, with local guides, just paddling quietly um, through the through this habitat, listening to the the sounds of the, of the forest and, uh, and and watching the wildlife from the water. Um, you know, on these on these dugout canoes, it's a fabulous way to watch wildlife. So relaxing and peaceful, and just um, soaking up yeah, the, the the incredible atmosphere of the of the habitat we're in. And there'll be as I said, a whole range of different species, of course. This is um, a blue and blue and yellow macaw, of course. There'll be noisy flocks of macaws, and they're still thankfully quite uh, quite abundant in these uh, in these areas. Spangled spangled cotinga is a is a is a lovely, lovely species to, to see and, and, and some of your typical Amazonian um, species toucans. There's white-throated toucan here, which has a very sort of distinct loud um, call, which often alerts you to their presence um, before before you see them. Swallowtail kite might be might be drifting overhead so just a great range of, of species we'll be we'll be seeing as we as we explore the the, the park um with with day-to-day -day outings in those in those smaller boats um searching for wildlife but back on the um 
back on the Urasima, we can uh, yeah relax on the top deck, scan the surroundings where all you can see is, is waterways and and these forested um, islands, and uh, you can set the set the scopes up and scan the area. And there's there's lots to enjoy. And just waking up every, each morning, just the views views like this. No no one else in sight, of course. Um, really really out in the in in, in the wilds and in this fantastically remote, incredibly biodiverse um, area. This is a, a Sibba. This is a, a, a local who lives in the who lives in the in the Zhao National Park, and it's sort of a it's, a it's a flooded forest. So these these islands will become flooded, and and you can sort of paddle through the um, these the, uh, the these these flooded areas of, of rainforest, and finding finding wildlife that way. And Sibba will explain about the, you know the life there, and and, and it's a you know, fascinating insight into you know, into how it is to you know to to essentially live in this. Uh, live in this habitat and a shot here of the group just carefully paddling through this incredible habitat and um, finding wildlife uh, as we go and just soaking up the, the atmosphere of the place. Um, here we, there's a, a number of different trogons we can see. This is a white-tailed um, trogon here and, and we sharp eyed to spot great potu blending in perfectly there with the uh, um, with the branch. They'll, 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 they'll roost like this in the daytime in a, in a, in a pose to obviously uh, make themselves look like a like a like a branch themselves, um, and this is a, a member of the Katinga family, a rather a, you know dull-looking member of the the Katinga, the Katinga family, the um, the screaming piha, um, and this is a very typical sound, and uh, and I've got a, my next slide here will um, will show you it makes up for the for its quite dull appearance with an incredible um, call, and whenever I hear it, it just takes me back to time in the in the Amazon, whether that's in Brazil or or Peru or Guyana, and this video is actually taken in Guyana, but it's uh, it's a sound we'll hear often. Um, paddling through these uh, through this this habitat, and I'll just see if you can have a listen to this. An amazing sound, and uh, yeah, it takes me right back to the the, the you know exploring the the Amazon, you know, a fab fabulous bird and an amazing sound. Huatzins. Or, or, or chicken birds, they call them, or stink birds. Lots of different names the locals have got for the for, for these, uh, you know, these incredible birds, and uh, you know, lots of um, you know fascinating uh, you know, you know, facts we can learn about these uh, about this species. They feed pretty much totally on on, on vegetation, on leaves, um, which you know, which uh, you know, gives them their name uh, when it, when that when that comes out the uh, the other end. But they're they're lots and often lots of uh, uh, lots of these birds in in, in flocks. Um, the young birds actually have. They're, they're, they're very thought to be you know, related to the sort of you know, first you know, first birds around, and some of the the chicks have little um, claws on their wings, and they when if they fall out of the nest over the over the water, they just clamber back up through the through the riverside vegetation. So they're quite abundant and hoatzin on this on this tour. Mammal wise, red howler monkeys and brown th brown throated sloths. We hope we hope to see and lots of reptiles. Is black caiman, um, and just exploring every day in these. These lovely dugout canoes and just exploring the uh, the area. Golden back to your carry. And we'll, we'll take walks on the island as well. It won't all be by boat. We'll be walking on some of these these islands and uh, to uh, to get to get close to the to the wildlife. And as we cruise, we might um, be lucky to see pink river dolphin as well in, inhabit these uh, the, these waters. There's so much to enjoy. Um, spectacle owl, um, Amazonian umbrella bird. The list of species just goes on. King vulture. And the fantastic wire-tailed mannequin we'll, we'll try and see as well. So there's so much to enjoy um, as we're as we're exploring and, and, and getting out for walks and, and, and cruises on the um, paddling on the, on the on the smaller boats as well. And there'll be some brilliant areas to moor up in the evening. We'll um, you know, pick a different spot each each evening to you know to lay anchor and moor up and, and get out onto these sandbanks and just sit and just look up at the sky. Just what an incredible place to to to, to visit and uh, and experience. As we head back down the, the the Rio Negro and on our way back to Manaus, we'll 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 stop off at uh, some you know, you know, a, a local village and, uh, and 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 stop off there and and, and, and yeah, meet some locals and uh, and uh, maybe even get involved with a bit of a bit of a dance and uh, and, and and talk and um, meet some of the, the the folk that live here. And that's always fascinating, of course, to to appreciate the you know the culture and have a little bit of an insight into that as well. And we certainly do that on this. Uh, on this cruise, so it's uh, yeah, ab absolutely fantastic. So my final slide for for the Amazon cruise will be just a lovely view out over the out over the Zhao National Park here, and uh, a fabulous fabulous tour. 
So that's a real whistle stop, 10 minutes uh, blasting through the, the, the our fabulous um, Amazon cruise. And for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to cover the, um, the, the Pantanal and our, and, our, and our cruise there. Um, and they can be combined, I should mention that. We, I, I, I always, um, well, the, 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 the cruise is come, but you can combine the Pantanal if you wanted to visit with the Amazon cruise. Um, that's, that's always an option. So the, uh, yep, to get to the Pantanal, we're flying into Sao Paulo again, but this time you take an internal flight then to Cuiaba. And this pale green area here, just a little bit larger than England, is the, is, is the world's largest wetland, the, the, the Pantanal. And we're, of course, just covering a small area in the, in the, northern, the northern Pantanal. So the, uh, the tour starts, we spend one night um, on the edge of, on the edge of Coyaba, at a nice hotel there to pick up some nice, some nice wildlife and, 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 uh, and, and get over the flight. Um, it's got some lovely grounds at the, at the hotel we use just on the edge of the city. And then we spend the whole of the next day, pretty much covering the, the, the Transpantanera Road, this, this incredible um, 147 kilometer road that, that, uh, that, that runs out in Porto Joffre. The plan was to, was to, was to span the, the, the Pantanal, so it was to cross the Pantanal, but of course building a road across the world's largest wetlands isn't a very good idea, so it just, it runs out at Porto Joffre and that's where we, where we, where we board the, uh, the Panoramico and head on then to, uh, to, to, to find Jaguars and, and, and focus on Jaguars there, but the, the journey along the Transpantanera is absolutely, you know, chock full of wildlife wherever you look, it's one of those roads where if you're, you know, if you're, if you're into your wildlife, you just, yeah, you just have to do it. And there's the famous sign there. As soon as you pass through that, that famous uh, Transpantanera sign, it's, it's just, you know, wildlife galore and, uh, and yeah, game on really. And every single little, you know, dot here, you, you can see a Yakari Cayman, millions of Yakari Cayman, you're, you're absolutely guaranteed to see them. And lots of egrets and, and, and storks here, um, you know, wood storks and, uh, and great egrets. And there'll be a whole host of other, um, heron species, of course, Jabiru stalks, brilliant for photography. So all none of these slides I'm using are you know, professionally taken shots. <clears throat> they're all um, they're all either you know, by by tour leaders or myself or by mo most of them are by group members. So the Yekari Cayman um, having a having a munch on a catfish. Um, as we're going along, these are snail kites often gathering in big numbers, hundreds and hundreds of, of snail kites swirling swirling around. Um, they got really hooked. Um, bill for, for for taking snails out of their shells, particularly apple snails, amazing species. Kingfishers, um, all five species can be seen with uh, you know, five of the of the uh, South American species can be seen relatively easily um, in a in, in a visit to the Spanish. This ringed kingfisher here, the, the the largest of them, and in the top end of the Transpantanera, a chance to see um, giant anteater. It's sort of dry. You're in, you're in the Pantanal. It's sort of gallery forest when you get down to the um, you know, Porto Joffre, um, but in the, you know, broken with, along the Transpantanera, you know, paddocks and open grasslands, and it's a, a good habitat, good chance to see the fabulous giant anteater. As we head further south along the Transpantanera, it gets wetter, and you start to see scenes like this, just vast um, open areas, you know, you know, areas of water and, and you know, water lilies and water hyacinths, and, and lots and lots of wildlife. All the, all the water bodies really will be you know, this, this is a typical scene. You know, lots and lots of your carry came in with capybaras just relaxing in amongst them and just lo lots and lots to see. It's actually difficult to keep, you know, you're stopping every few meters. Sometimes when you need to make progress, it's very difficult because there's just so much to look at. And you said, well, say, well, we're, we're never going to make it to the end of this road if we, we don't move a little bit more. But it's just so difficult because there's just so, you know, so much to see. Roseate spoonbill and black bellied whistling ducks. And eventually we will get to, um, you know, Porto Joffre uh, and board the board the Panoramico, um, a lovely uh, a lovely house houseboat, um, and uh, and very comfortable um, very very comfortable accommodation uh, indeed very spacious rooms open lovely open dining area, um, and uh, yeah it's our our base for the for, for the next uh, for the next week a few shots of the of the rooms here, and again we'll head out on on motorboats um, to you know, to take to the water and explore the explore the area, explore various different rivers. Well, again, we're mooring up in a different spot each night. So we're moving around um, and, uh, and, and heading out in these smaller boats to, to search for, for the re reason we're going to the Pantanal really is, is the fabulous Jaguar. And we'll be cruising on the riverways, looking for little openings in the gallery forest. They hunt along these, along the riverbanks and hoping to see um, a Jaguar just sat in one of these openings 
um, looking back at us like this animal here. Um, absolutely incredible moment when you first sort of lay eyes on a you know on a jaguar. And they're doing very well in this area. Um, the, the sort of core jaguar zone, as they call it. Um, they they sort of log the the different animals here, um, and the numbers are, are seen in this area to be you know, you, you, to be increasing and more land being 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 turned into you know, jaguar friendly land with with more people visiting. So it's a, it's it's a great example of how ecotourism is is working in this area. So we have we have time to to see some incredible behaviour um, as well. You know, we want, it's it's not just a case of a fleeting glimpse. Um, we've got you know th this is a, a, an adult and a, and it's and it's young having a tug of war with a yellow um, anaconda, which is one of the most amazing photos that I've been sent. I mean, many many photos. Each group comes back with some incredible jaguar photos, and it's just just one of those. One of my personal favourites is heading off at the. Um, up, up, up the Procuri, um River and just rounding the corner and two um, you know, two jaguar um, cubs swimming across the, um, the, the the channel there, two heads in the water swimming uh, swimming across, and Mum was on one side, you know, calling loudly to get them to to get the the, the, the young to come back towards her, and we, we we you know we backed off of course, we 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 stayed right back and just watched watched it unfold. We're the only boat with them, um, and eventually. Um, the, the, the young didn't listen to their parents uh, at all, didn't listen to mum at all, typically, and, uh, and, uh, and bounded up the other side. It was a really, really amazing um, you know, bit of behaviour uh, to, to watch. So as well as jaguars, there's so much else to see. This is what the fabulous agami heron with this mane like feathering on, on the neck. What an incredible um, heron species that is. Really long dagger-like bill. Look at the legs of that bill there. Um, and a refescent tiger heron. Um, they're very very common, the, the, the Refesa tiger heron, but you know, an, an amazing bird. Might round another corner and hyacinth macaws and, and black vultures there. Um, and we'll work all the way to the to the, the, the actual national park itself. So we'll, we'll cover that sort of the, the, the main sort of core jaguar area, but unlike our other tours to the Pantanal, we strike out and head all the way to the to the fully protected national park. It's, it, you know, it's a really, really remote area. You won't be seeing other boats here. Very few people you know, head this far into the heart of the of the Pantanal and reach these sort of mountainous areas um, in the distance. <clears throat> it's a real sort of expedition into the into the heart of the Pantanal, and a scene here of the <clears throat> of the of the sort of protected um, you know national park area of the of the Pantanal. And people don't really um, you know think of this sort of typical scene as as, as a as being as, as being part of the of the Pantanal. Our other tours focus on the more on just the the, the, the wetland areas vast areas of these huge Amazonian water lilies here um, that uh, you, know, you often see birds walking across very uh, they're, they're huge and this is the lovely sun bittern um, quite tricky to see in some areas you know Guyana and Peru and other, other areas but in the Pantanal they seem to be all, all over the place and they're particularly incredible when they um, when when they take when they take flight and show these amazing patches on their wings a, a stunning bird um, uh, indeed and tapir is another another species we've got a I've got a good chance to um, to, you know, to see uh, during the cruise. They're making various stops and they often come into the water to to bathe. Got a good chance of, of seeing them. These photos were all taken on the on the last cruise. So these are these are photos from the from the tour itself. Um, and giant giant otters. Uh, we've you know we've, on all you know all our visits to the Pantanal, you 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 can expect some fabulous views of giant otters moving around in big family parties, noisy groups um, feeding on you know you need to eat a lot of fish and they're often squabbling over over fish and, and, and munching on them and you can yeah get really really incredible views and, and photos like this big numbers of capybara or herds of herds of capybara they're very very common and when we finish the cruise um, we'll, we will again have to of course retrace our steps back up the Transpantanera and we'll spend a night at a lodge a little sort of midway along the Transpantanera on the way back. Um, and here we have a, 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 the, the opportunity to, to visit a, a hide to watch for ocelot. So the highlights are really just endless on this tour. And it's another sort of star species we can, we can hope to see. And um, the, the fabulous ocelot, beautiful, um, you know, slender cat. Um, and uh, yeah, very good chance of, of, of seeing them. So only when jaguars move into this area that uh, the, 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 the ocelot sort of move out, but there's not such a density here. So we've got a very good chance of seeing Ocelot. There's even a little area now where, where, where you know, um, tapir move in, into in the evening um, for, for another chance that this, uh, this fabulous species uh, comes in and, and, and munches through, through mangoes of an evening. It's another 
another you know, another wonderful experience. So that's a whistle stop through those two cruises. We do uh, we run lots of other tours to the Pantanal. Absolutely, you know, incredible destination. Um, and you can add on lots of different uh, you know, different extras. So those of you that might have a holiday book to, on, on our just Jaguars tour, for instance, or our Pantanal and the Guazu tour, there's an incredible chance at the moment for um, to see you know, to see harpy eagles. And there's in fact a, a, a nest not too far from Cuyaba, which limits of limits and flying involved with it. So it's a and this is the chick that literally hatched a few a few weeks ago. Um, and there's a tower looking over the nest, just about 25 meters away. Incredible, um, incredible views of, of harpy eagle. Um, and it's very popular to, to add on heading down to the incredible Iguazu Falls. And we have a tour that combines the Pantanal and Iguazu um, as well. And it's a, a spectacular photo of the fall. So, so much, so many options in Brazil and, uh, and, and so much to enjoy. And um, yeah, that's just a taster of it. So yeah, thank you very much. We've gone a little bit over there, but I will hand you back to, to, to Sarah now. And um, yeah, thank you very, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a fantastic talk. You did really well to, to cram all of that. There was two different destinations there into 20 minutes. I know it's not easy. And thank you very much to, uh, to Ed for his talk earlier. Folks, we'll go to um, a quick break now, 10 minutes. Uh, we'll be back at uh, just under 10 minutes, actually 25 past eight, where I'll be taking you to Indonesia. Now, um, by request, instead of playing music for the interval, I will show you the the uh, residents of my fish tank. This is uh, the final opportunity <laughs> that uh, folk can have to watch my fish during the uh, during the interval. Oh, we've even got people saying, yeah, yes, please, fish tank. It's coming, Larissa, it's coming. So I've got two kitchen chairs that I have to stack here and delicately balance my laptop on top of it. I practiced it earlier, it worked fine. So bear with me for one minute um, and I'll be back with some fish. And I've got some new fish since uh, the last time I shared my screen. So they're, they're delighted to make their debut this evening. So back at uh, eight twenty-five, folks. See you shortly. That's fun.
Okay, folks, we are back. And I hope you've all had a chance to top up your drinks. And I'm now going to take us to Indonesia. Let's just try and get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about our cruise from Bali to Komodo. I lead our cruises uh, in different parts of the world, in, in Scotland, the Arctic, the Maldives, Baja, and sometimes the, uh, the Azores, our holidays in the Azores, which aren't cruises, they're land-based, but we're watching tours in the Azores, as well as our cruises from Bali to Komodo. And that's where I'm going to take you from uh, on a journey on this evening, as we sail from these islands uh, east of Bali around to uh, West Nusa Tenggara, which takes about 10 days. And just so you can get your bearings, this is the region I'll be talking about, which is outlined in red here, and in Indonesia straddles both Indi Indian and Pacific Oceans, and it's a country born of fire. The region has been shaped over the millennia by huge tectonic forces and the slow but unstoppable collision of the Indo-Australian and Eurasian tectonic plates. And from Bali, which is just here, if you can see my cursor, a great arc of volcanic island stretches to the east along here, including Lombok, Sumbawa, Komodo and Flores, all of which are islands that we'll see which are along here. And some of these are now quiet. The heat from beneath them has subsided a long time ago, but others still retain their internal furnace and awaken from time to time. And when looking at this map, it's really amazing to think that this is considered one country because it's made up of over 17,000 islands, 300 different languages are spoken here and six official religions are observed. And as you'd expect, it's a real melting pot of different cuisines and cultures with many islands being quite different from each other. All of them lie in tropical seas, home to the most diverse marine life of anywhere in the world with over 3,500 species of fish, which is more than enough to keep even the keenest of snorkelers totally enthralled. And a wonderful array of tropical whales and dolphins as well. But the culture also provides a vibrant and colorful stimulation of, on all of the senses. And you've got some images here. There's Pura Bratan, which is a, a Shiva Hindu temple, uh, food offerings as well, which you'll see frequently in Bali, uh, out on the streets, uh, the edges of temples, outside shops. It's really just a fascinating place. And we fly into Denpasar on Bali, which is on the southern tip of Bali, if you can see me moving my cursor just here. And should anyone wish to do a pre-tour extension, then we travel to the northwest of Bali, where we visit Bali Barat National Park, and we stay there for three days. Uh, I'll just spend just one minute or two minutes telling you briefly about this. This is our accommodation on the extension. Um, it's a completely secluded lodge in the heart of the park and we stay in tranquil bungalows and we go out birding each day. So this is a bird watching extension. If you don't want to go bird watching, perhaps you're traveling with your partner who wants to go birding, then there are alternative activities that you can do. You can have a massage at the spa, uh, relax on the small beach while sipping out of a coconut or go snorkeling on the coral reef just next to the bar. And it feels very exclusive and, and quiet and secluded. So we go out bird watching in the mornings before breakfast and then again in the afternoon when it's cooler. So during the, um, the middle of the day is free time. And this is a highlight of, a stay, of our stay here. This is a Javan banded pitta, which we saw hopping around in the leaf litter within some bushes. And we positioned ourselves to get a good view of it and just marveled at the stunning plumage of this lovely bird, which was lit up beautifully in the sunlight, about only 10, 12 meters away from us. And um, Java is west of Bali, but it can be seen uh, on Bali, but not further east than that. And another gem uh, of staying in this national park are the Bali starlings. Now, these are critically endangered and they're highly sought after for the pet trade. 
And by the early 1990s, the wild population had diminished to only around 30 birds. And the continuance of extreme poaching meant that 10 years later, there were only two or three breeding pairs left in the national park. Uh, following a captive breeding and release program, the numbers have thankfully now increased and wild born starlings are now once again being seen breeding in the park and seeing these bright white birds fly overhead and on a couple of occasions perched on the tops of trees next to us was just a fantastic sight. And if you don't join us on the extension, then this is the start of the holiday, a lovely beachside hotel, which is a short ride from the airport. So those on the extension will arrive here at the same time, roughly uh, in the afternoon. We have chalet type huts right on the beach. It's a great place to wander and just explore. There's culture hidden all around the, even in the hotel, uh, the hidden shrines in the hotel grounds and signs of worship. And Bali's official religion is Hindu, but it's far too animistic to be considered the same vein as Indian Hinduism. The Balinese worship the trinity of Brahma, Shiva and Vishnu, uh, which are three aspects of one uh, God, one invisible God, amongst many other gods, such as the gods of earth, fire, water, mountains, gods of fertility, rice, technology, books, and even demons who inhabit the world underneath the ocean. So there are hundreds of different shrines to be uncovered. And it's quite fun just to go exploring even around the hotel grounds. You don't have to go very far at all. And we'll go for our dinner, our evening meal, just at a nice bar along the beach. So that, and there's a huge sumptuous breakfast waiting for us the next morning. And then we board our vessel, which is our home for the next week. We use both of these boats, uh, depending on uh, which uh, week it is that we're running the trip. So the itinerary online will explain very clearly which boat it is. They're both very similar and I've been on both boats. Both are fantastic and superb for our needs. And the typical day that you see here, we'll wake up in the morning, um, have some fresh fruit, a slice of toast, a quick cup of tea, and then we'll be out snorkeling. And the water is just luxuriously warm. It feels like you're swimming around in a, in a bath, really. And we'll have a lovely morning snorkel, hop back on board, showers, and then a full hot breakfast. And we'll move out into deeper water where we'll sail uh, for the day looking for cetaceans. Then we'll snorkel again uh, in the afternoon, later afternoon, have an evening talk. Uh, either by, by myself or my co-leader Chaz and then we'll have dinner and we also try and weave in island walks as well um, either early in the morning perhaps late in the evening uh, depending on, on whereabouts we are and what's what we've seen that day and how our itinerary is going and these are just some photographs here for you to uh, see what the boat looks like so you can get uh, a flavour of what the accommodation is like. We have a suite here, a lovely saloon, a sun deck up at the top. This is the uh, the party deck on the bottom right there. It's great fun to sit out there and, and read a book. And I always encourage people to join me out on deck as well. People can come join me at the front of the boat to look for cetaceans as we're sailing. The more eyes, the better. I'll be out um, I, I find it really difficult to leave the bow of a boat with my binoculars as long as we're moving. There's potentially things that we could see. So I'm known for even taking my lunches out uh, on the front deck because I just don't like to, to leave it. But it's great when I get a really enthusiastic crowd like this where people just want to be out spotting with me all the time, which we so often get on nature trek trips with people full of enthusiasm for it. And we've barely even left. The, the island of Bali before our cruise starts to get really exciting because overnight, if I just move my cursor here, so we'll, we'll start in Denpasar and then we start to sail east. So overnight, we're going to cross the line of Wallacea, which is an imaginary line here in between Bali and Lombok. And this is where naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution by the process of natural selection, of course, along with uh, our very own Charles Darwin, noted on his travels that Asian flora and fauna gave way to Australasian flora and fauna. So when he arrived from Bali onto Lombok, he expected to hear the sounds of woodpeckers, fruit thrushers and oriental barbits that he had heard so often in Malaysia, in Borneo and on Bali. But instead he was met with the piercing call of the helmeted friar bird and Australian cockatoos. And this is because 17,000 years ago, during the last ice age, the planet's sea levels were much lower. So the water was locked up as ice. So the landmass on the west 
everything from Java westwards was all joined. But there was a trench between Bali and Lombok, which is a thousand meters deep. And this never went away. So this was still filled with water and therefore a limited vegetation dispersal. And thus it, it limited the species which was able to feed upon it. So they couldn't get any further than Lombok, any species coming from the east. And this led him to discover uh, evolution at the same time as Charles Darwin did. And this is a typical scenery. We stop off at islands like this. This is Satonda. This is an extinct volcano. It's a fantastic place to snorkel. It's one of my most favorite places to stop. And we see no one else around here. We just have the reef to ourselves. Uh, we stay here for the night uh, just off of this island. And uh, at sunset, it's a fantastic spot to position ourselves to look for sunder fruit bats leaving their roosts. And uh, once in position, we'll get our binoculars and go up on deck and see hundreds of black dots in the trees. And as the sun starts to go down, they all start flying. And this is because they, they nest on Satonda on this island, but they go and feed on the neighboring island of Sumbawa. But they don't nest on Sumbawa because uh, there's, lot, there's more disturbance, there's uh, other animals that could disturb them, there's humans, there's dogs and things like that. So, but there's not enough food at all on this small volcano for them. And this is what it looks like when they start leaving their roosts. Absolutely incredible. And this is what they uh, you can see the night during the day, all tucked up um, and, uh, and having a roost. And when we sail off the following morning, we'll probably have another snorkel. Uh, this is my group out here. Uh, you can see me uh, giggling in the back, all, all having a good laugh uh, on en route to another snorkel. We have two small ribs on board, which you can see being driven here by really fantastic experienced crew, uh, which run us over to the reefs. Um, there's a cool box, which you can see next to my, my yellow fins there. Um, and the crew is so well um, well at catering, uh, good at catering for us. When you hand your fins back on board, and they, they know which fins are yours um, and they'll number your fins at the start of the trip and then they number a water bottle for you, which they keep in this cool box. So I have number 20 still on the underside of my fins, even though I haven't been out to, to Bali um, for two and a half years now because of the pandemic. I uh, still have a number 20 on the underside of my fins and they'll take my fins off me, pull me up on board and then they reach into the cool box and grab the a cool water bottle which has a number 20 on it and they hand that straight to you and you can just sit and uh, and have a lovely cold drink as they sail you back on board absolutely brilliant and it is just another world under the waves these are cliffs here which we were snorkeling along and they're carpeted with coral and sea fans and sea stars and anemones and hiding places for thousands and thousands of fish and we were swimming here in a channel um, with apparently barren cliffs above us. Um, and you think, gosh, there's not much to see here. The water looks a little bit dark. Uh, is it too appealing? I'm not sure. You hop in and then this is what greets you. You don't need to swim too far to enjoy it either. You can just stay in one spot for 10 minutes and keep seeing new things. And every time I watch an episode of Blue Planet, I'm really taken back to the reefs of Indonesia. Indeed, much of it was actually filmed here. Uh, the two items, uh, species at the top, uh, are sea slugs. They're very difficult to find, but we have dive guides on board who will be helping me find them and pointing them out to you. And also an octopus at the bottom left there and anemone fish. And I'm also very happy to run a fish club each evening to help people ID their photographs. So an underwater ca uh, camera will be a great companion uh, to take with you on this trip. It's great fun just sitting in the evening trying to um, get your head around the, the myriad of fish species that they have there. I've got fish guidebooks on board. You can take your own. And it's great just to have clients who enjoy just putting a tick next to the photographs of the species that they've seen in their books and uh, for, for memory's sake, really. And they, the fish vary vastly. Some are stunningly beautiful and make a point of standing out on the reef. They really want to be seen like this Mandarin fish here, absolutely gorgeous. But others opt for camouflage. Now there are two fish in this image and I wonder if you can see them. I'll give you a few seconds. I'll uh, give you a hint. You're looking for ghost pipe fish. If anyone knows what goat pipe, ghost pipe fish look like, then you'll, it might help you try and find them. But if you've, oh, someone, yeah, Lindsay's raising a hand. Lindsay, I'm gonna take that to mean that you can see them. Well done, you get the gold star. 
So I'll move my cursor here and we've got two fish. We've got one here and they're hanging vertically in the water with their heads down. So this is the tail of the, of the first fish and this is its nose here. And we have another fish here just behind it. And these are ghost pipe fish. So beautifully evolved to just completely mimic the seagrass which is behind them and they float motionlessly in the water so they just float backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards getting carried with the sea current which is just incredible and an amazing example of, uh, of camouflage if i just move it onto another slide here you can see um another ghost pipe fish but this has got a much more contrasting background so you can see the sort of fish that we're looking for but really fantastic to see them out on the reef again very tricky to find but myself and the guides are always looking out for uh, unique little critters like that to, to point out to you uh, many turtles as well can be seen this is a hawksbill turtle uh, quite confiding which uh, can sometimes approach the cameras and lots of fish to be seen in the backgrounds there and it's not just Turtles are the larger species which we can see on the reefs as well. And my particular favorite species to see has to be this one, which you're about to see here when we dive into the water. And of course, this is the manta ray. I'll just mute the sounds there. The manta ray, which are absolutely majestic animals, and they're really a privilege to see. They're feeding here on plankton, which you can see is all the small stuff scattering about in the photograph. It looks like underwater snow in the video, I should say. And they have these cephalic fins which they use to guide the food into their mouth extremely peaceful creatures and they're feeding on plankton so zooplankton and phytoplankton just small microscopic animals and plants in the water there's actually a jack uh, swimming underneath that that ray it's sheltering and hiding it's uh, completely shadowing it which is <laughs> quite funny and reef mantas are around sort of three meters uh, from wingtip to wingtip but oceanic mantas, these are reef mantas here, oceanic mantas get to about six meters, which is a, an incredible size. And whenever I see a manta ray, I just have a, a, an extreme feeling of electricity just going straight down to my fingertips. And it, it's just an incredible experience. We have people talking in the bar every evening excitedly, comparing uh, how close the manta ray or the turtle or the fish came to them and sharing photos with one another and uh, it's it's really just just wonderful and we'll get off for uh, walks as frequently as we can um, i particularly enjoy sunset walks so this is padar and if you've been to the galapagos it might look familiar with um, a similar volcanic topography which has formed the two bays here and and it's really nice to to spend half an hour walking up this island. Uh, all walks are completely optional, I will I'll say. So you don't have to go very far and uh, walking up this this island to see the lovely sunset view. And Komodo National Park is a, a landscape of contrast between, between rugged hillsides of dry savanna, pockets of thorny green vegetation, and also brilliant white sandy beaches and blue waters surging over coral. Um, and it's really unquestionably one of the most dramatic landscapes in, in Indonesia. And it's located in the center of the Indonesian archipelago between the islands of Sumbawa and Flores. And it's composed of three major islands, Rinka, Komodo and Padar. And we'll walk on the islands of Rinka and Komodo. Uh, we get to the islands early to avoid the heat of the day. This is, again is the beauty of having our own charter. We can just get there at uh, whatever time suits us and we'll make the most of the, the cooler temperatures. We'll walk around with their guides. This, this is the chap here uh, in the blue top who will stay with us at all times. And the bird life of interest uh, includes the yellow crested cockatoo, which is critically endangered due to poaching for the pet, pet trade. It's lovely to see them fly overhead uh, in pairs occasionally. Green jungle fowl, a stunning bird. Olive back sunbird. Uh, Timor deer and whenever there are, is prey there's going to be predators and this 
is what we're searching for. It's the most remarkable inhabitant of the Komodo National Park. It's the Komodo dragon, of course, and they can reach two and a half to three meters in length, weigh up to 90 kilos, and they're the largest lizards in the world. And they'll feed on wild pigs, deer, water buffalo, and they have venom glands. The venom, it's a mild venom, it acts as an anticoagulant, but they also have a mouthful of bacteria as well, which um, brings on sepsis when they, they bite their prey. And they can walk up to seven miles a day, but they usually prefer to stay closer to home. They're rarely seen venturing far from the, the, valley, the valleys where they've been hatched. And they, they exist nowhere else in the world. And they're of great scientific interest, especially from an evolutionary point of view. And the species is the last representative, really, of a relic population of large lizards that once lived across Indonesia and Australia. And we'll take three opportunities to see them, twice on land and once by boat as well. I'm going to see them on the beach. Uh, it's a great experience because you see, uh, you get to take photographs just like this of them coming into the water. And we're also, I've been mentioning, we're on the lookout for cetaceans. This is a sperm whale, which we saw uh, on the, one of my recent trips out to, to Bali, most recent when I was out there a couple of years ago. And uh, we have a videographer on board. Um, it's just a part of the crew. They, they tend to provide a videographer who had a drone and we sent a drone up to photograph this sperm whale. And we just got stunning views of it and um, watching it live on the camera as well as live right in front of us. Also false killer whales, melon headed whales, spinner dolphins, spotted dolphins, rissos and phrases dolphins. Other possible species include blue whales, cuvier's beaked whales, dwarf sperm whales, rough toothed dolphins. It's a fantastic place for a lot of different cetacean species uh, to be seen. And these are pantropical spotted dolphins here and phrases dolphins there. They get um, a very pink belly. And this isn't pink pigment, this is, um, they're actually warm, they're actually a little bit flushed, a little bit warm from uh, doing too much active swimming. So they've got clear skin down there when they get flushed and a bit warm, they get pink tummies, but fabulous to see. And as is tradition on a nature trick presentation, I'll end here with a, a sunset. And if you've got really keen eyes, cetacean spotting eyes like myself, you'll clearly see there's a whole load of melon headed whales in the water. Mm -hmm. Uh, just in front of us. There's actually about 200 we had around us, but only in the image there you'll see just uh, two there and two or three here. Um, please do go online to our tour page. I'll send an email um, linking to this tomorrow where you'll see uh, a video of our cruise, which gives a really good comprehensive overview of the trip and some fantastic cinematography of the underwater snorkeling as well. But that's just a taster of our cruise to Indonesia. And I'll now hand you over to Ed, who's going to take us on to the Solomon Islands, continuing on the tropical theme. Over to you, Ed. Lovely, thanks, Sarah. All right, let me just pop that in there. Just share my screen. Wonderful, yes. Well, as Sarah says, uh, that was well. That was just a fabulous introduction, really, to to just some of the scrumptious kind of snorkeling you can have in that part of the world, and obviously some of the cetaceans. And so we're going to go a little bit more east now of uh, Komodo and uh, Bali um, to the Solomon Islands. And back in 2018, now I had uh, just this fabulous opportunity to take a group of 17 people to the Solomon Islands. We went via Australia. So I'm just going to show you actually where the Solomon Islands are, in case you don't know. So if we're, we're all the way up the top here, just before it says Sweden, all around the corner. And, Papa, and uh, the Solomon Islands are just east of Papua New Guinea. So actually what we did on this tour, we actually flew all the way uh, across to Brisbane and we went up into the rainforest area uh, about an hour outside of uh, an hour and a half outside of Brisbane, where we uh, spent three or four days just accommodating to the time zone and the temperature and got to see some nice Australian rainforest birds before we then flew three hours uh, northeast from uh, Brisbane to the Solomon Islands. And the tour very much was, it, again, it was with um, Chaz, who was very much uh, with, with uh, Sarah in, uh, in, in Komodo and Bali. And Chaz is very much a um, cetologist, really, sort of studying cetaceans, whales and dolphins. And so the idea of the Solon Island trip was to really focus on the sea life, but still have visits to the islands as well. But not too far off from the, you can just see the Solomon Islands here up in the top right, 
not too far off the, the coastline, really, round here, just south of where it's the Solomon Islands, the sea drops away to deeper water. And of course, where you get deeper water, you get lots of nutrients coming up from the deep, uh, providing lots of food for plankton, zooplankton, and then in turn providing food for the fishes and then food for the, uh, the cetaceans, the whales and dolphins. So on our particular trip, uh, we flew into Honiara, which is on the uh, Guadalcanal Island over here. And we did a, a lovely circumnavigation really to the west, all the way over towards um, Georgia Island, but just peeking out a little bit into these deeper waters, which were gonna be very good for whales and dolphins. And in particular, we were on the lookout for uh, a very, unknown whale really called the Mura's whale which was only properly named as a species in 2000 just checking my notes here in um, 2003 um, but actually it had been uh, spotted before then but not necessarily identified I shall tell you more about that in a short while we were staying on the um, Bibikiki uh, which actually is a sort of a, a dive boat, a little bit like what Sarah was on in Bali and Komodo, but very much suited to uh, our needs. The rooms were air conditioned, which was fabulous because it was very tropical heat, very hot heat sometimes. Uh, we were graced always with bowls of uh, lovely popcorn with salt to keep our uh, mineral levels up. But if we wanted to cool off, then we had the air conditioned rooms below, which of course was late. But this was a lovely boat. Um, we had a great crew, a local crew. So we're all from some of the local different islands. Um, using local foods which I'll show you in a moment and we went out each day on the tinny boats um, so we had two of these to take us out and to get us into the nooks and crannies and the, get us onto land really to see uh, things a bit closer and we had a very similar itinerary to Sarah really uh, in terms of we, we usually had a morning and an afternoon snorkel uh, very similar sorts of timings really and using the tinnies to go out and uh, and, and, and go snorkeling and of course, we had some beautiful, beautiful sunsets as well. This was on one of our first days where we were just getting to know each other with some beautiful food. I'll show you some of the food in a moment. And just watching the, the sun go down across the islands. It, re it really was amazing. And I think for me, I mean, when you look up the Solomon Islands, it's quite mysterious. You really don't quite know what it's going to be like when you land. You look on Google Maps, but, you know, it, it's, it's off the beaten track. So, so the, the quality of the images on Google Maps are not that detailed. So it was really intriguing to know what's it going to be like when we arrive, what's, what's, what's it going to look like, what are the people going to be like, etc. And so it was really fantastic just getting a sense of that and, and going to meet some indigenous people that were living on the islands, which are, are coming to right at the very end. But it really was amazing going to part of the world that we know very little about, that we hear very little about, and there's very little information online. And although a lot of Australians do go to some islands to holiday, it's generally, you know, still off the beaten track. So many of the reefs or all of the reefs pretty much are untouched. Uh, you know, they're not broken from diving or, you know, tourists. They're very much untouched and, and, and clean uh, reef beds, which, of course, was very much what a lot of the tour was about. Actually, it was about both watching whales and dolphins but also snorkeling and seeing the underwater life. And again, these beautiful colours being close to the equator and the, the long, wonderful drawn out colours here before it got dark at around 6 p.m. So we had some beautiful food on board as well. Again, catered really well for various different kind of eaters and diets and, and, and depending on what you were able to eat and not eat. They, they really dealt with that very well. And just, again, very beautiful, colourful food, looking lo local foods. Um, and it looked good, it tastes good, and there was just a really nice variety each day to uh, keep us going. And also the time just to relax as well. We were spending a lot of time on deck, a little bit like on Sarah's boat where we were up on deck doing lots of watching. But if the sun became a bit too unbearable, we were able to just relax and, and chill um, and, and still be able to see out to sea on the lower deck. And even on the boat itself, uh, particularly if you're interested in moths, there were still some moths attracted to some of the lights on the boat at night. So we got to see all sorts of tropical moths. I mean, look how big this one is. This was a huge, big moth on someone's palm here. So um, it was a really good opportunity to actually also do a little bit of mothing, if that's uh, of your interest, with a lot of these being, we were often more just off uh, some of the little islands. So these moths were probably just coming off um, from those islands each, each time. 
But for me, one of the really special things about the Solomon Islands was meeting people, was seeing the local people and getting an understanding of their lives. They're living on very low lying islands. They're very vulnerable to our changing climate and increasing sea level rises, but living very basic lives. They were coming to us on these very basic dugout canoes. Most of them are not wearing shoes. They've got these amazing feet because they're not wearing their toes and feet are not confined into shoes and just very beautiful uh wonderful friendly people and as i say the crew were from many of these villages as well so they had a real connection with with the people in that way and the the boat the Bilakiki, has this arrangement with local people to meet with them um every so often i think it's every 10 days to be able to buy a lot of their local produce and so this is what we were doing and this produce was being bought we bought pretty much most of this and it was then being used in the cooking and our food each day which was which was wonderful really and, and a great it really felt like a sustainable way of supporting the communities uh who who were out there and obviously growing these foods and look at the color of these tomatoes and these peppers and you know this was then being put into our food it was wonderful and this is what the terrain looked like really it was great going somewhere where you didn't just see palm trees or you didn't just see exposed rock from deforestation we were seeing you know very much intact islands now of course there is some forestry in places and we did certainly see palm trees and coconut trees on some islands but it was really great to see this very natural forest woodland on most of the islands and certainly not seeing uh, the sort of destruction that you might see in, in other parts of the world and you've got these coral uh, limestone fossil rich um islands basically that have kind of been pushed up gradually the sea levels have gone down or the, the islands have been pushed up over time um now always always treed up and we'd often be seeing things like solomon's cockatoo which is unique to the solomon islands flying around and and calling but of course the beauty was actually in what was below the water twice a day for us and doesn't matter whether you're a good good snorkel or not there was lots of support to be able to in, enable you to go in and we had some people that were perhaps a little bit less sure about snorkeling but the two guides we had were were dive um instructors and very good at providing support i've also been a, a dive uh, instructor uh, sort of teacher trainer myself when i used to dive so i was able to offer support as well and give people the opportunity to look underwater and experience what was there uh, and just to take it all in and, and like in indonesia and what, where, where, where sarah was you don't have to to go very far beneath the water to see the colours and to see the variety of wildlife. Here we've got some wonderful clownfish here, the kind of typical Nemo fish associating with the uh, anemones, um, which, which don't cause any sort of stinging sensation to the fish as far as we know. Beautiful corals and brain corals and all sorts of other things with beautiful colour fish. And we saw, uh, just checking my, my details, so we saw 130 species at least of tropical fish. And it was really exciting kind of in the evening time after dinner, there was a group of a group who were particularly keen to try and identify everything. And we were going through our photographs and trying to work out what they are. And of course, over this um two weeks or so really get into grips with what some of these different species were this was my favorite actually this was a bat fish uh, i got a beautiful wooden ornament which we were allowed to bring back through customs um through australia which which was made out of local wood of of a bat fish and uh, a really fabulous uh, quite friendly uh, fish in this case we saw a number of these on on occasion but these are just some of the views really looking into the cabins and some nights some days we saw black tipped reef sharks other days we were just looking at lots of beautiful colorful fish like these blue ones here just you know this must have been probably only a half a meter or a meter just under the surface really so just beautiful views this is in the uh, Mbulu uh, canyon and we got to visit all these different kind of dive sites really where normally people would be scuba diving and we but to be honest really we were getting to see as much beauty just by uh, snorkeling uh, this is a blue sea star which we saw lots of and the colours don't really do it justice. It's one of those things where once you get a few metres under the water, you kind of lose some of the colours, really. But but with the naked eye on with your face mask on, these were really just pristine, unbroken, you know, species rich coral reefs. They were just a marvel uh, to see each day. Here we've got a special kind of clam here with its beautiful sort of fleshy kind of edges just along here in amongst the coral. Another sea anemone uh, with the clownfish. 
and this beautiful red and black anemone fish. Isn't that stunning? Just a beautiful. And it was just brilliant to see these. We saw about half a dozen species of anemone fish. And, you know, I hadn't realised there were quite so many. It was just really wonderful to sort of see them so well and, and see them in different areas over the course of the journey. And this here, so well camouflaged, is fabulous clouded lizard fish, uh, looking very cryptic against the colours of the coral here. And these feather stars, which occasionally you sometimes saw actually swimming in the water, they take themselves off the coral and actually go for a little swim. And you can see their kind of undulating uh, arms and appendages as they're floating through the water, which is quite interesting to see. But of course, one of the reasons we were there actually were to see the whales and dolphins. And uh, in between the snorkeling, uh, when we were moving between locations, we had the opportunity. And, and, and just like in Komodo and uh, and um, Bali, we had the opportunity to see. Well, in this case, we actually saw, just checking my notes here, 16 species. I mean, like, like Sarah, I've been to the Azores, I've been to Monterey Bay, I've been to some, some fabulous whale and dolphin sites, but to see 16 different species of whale and dolphin was, was mind blowing. I and mean, I just couldn't believe it that every day, we were going to a different place and seeing and it. it just gave you an indication of the food and the richness of these species and and what else is further down the food chain so here we've actually got some pygmy killer whales um just coming out with their little white lips as they're coming out of the the water here we've got short fin pilot whales which perhaps some of you might be more familiar with these are certainly species you'll also get in places such as the azores for example coming out of the water but look at the crystal blue colour of the water in the sea here. It's absolutely beautiful. Here we've got some pan tropical spotted dolphins. Uh, usually when you see them up close, you can see it's almost like someone's had a pepper grinder and you've got all these little tiny black spots, but you can't see that so well on these particular animals, but just beautiful, clear blue water. Another one just coming out here. And one of my favourites, because they actually look quite prehistoric, um, these are roughed toothed dolphins and they've got quite a, a sort of sloping forehead um, and they almost look a little bit like an ichthyosaur, like, a, like an ancient sea dragon that would have been alive about 200 million years ago. Um, but these, of course, today, modern day dolphins quite happily swimming and we got to sometimes if you went snorkeling with the dolphins in the water, you could hear their squeaks um, and their clicks. Here's another couple of rough toothed dolphins with this lovely steel bit of seaweed and crystal blue water. But again, you can see how they look quite almost sea dragon like with that profile, ideally suited for swimming under the water. One of the big reasons for, for being out in the Solomon Islands was to try and find a, a, a a whale really, which was unknown to the Solomon Islands, certainly since 1976. And as I say, it had only been named as the Emura's whale in 2003. And this whale we're looking at here is the Brooder's whale, the bride's whale, which um, you might see if you've been to New Zealand, you might see if you've been to the Azores, perhaps to Madeira. They're certainly found uh, across a wide band of the tropics. And if you get to see the top of their head, the kind of rostrum area, which is the big kind of top of the mouth and head area, they've got three ridges, one that's kind of in the center and two, one that goes on either side. And so we were looking for a similar sort of whale, similar size tropical whale, but only had one line, one ridge along the top of the rostrum and perhaps a more mottled kind of patterned skin. And that's what we were looking for. So we certainly saw uh, the brood as well uh, of this one here, you can see here. And then finally, after days of watching and towards the end of the tour, we got to see this wonderful mother and calf Amura's whale. And these were the first confirmed sightings of the actual species since 1976. Now, of course, I am sure that the local people probably see these every day and have probably seen them very regularly. But from a science perspective, in terms of actually, you know, identifying this animal and being able to log it from a scientific and conservation perspective, we were seeing the first confirmed Amura's whale since 1976. The first specimens actually had actually been logged 42 years ago by Japanese whalers who killed, I think, about half a dozen and actually had measured them and actually logged the details in their log books. But of course, at that point, they hadn't been identified as a different species. It's only now 
when Chaz and other people have been uh, uh, and Japanese scientists have looked back at this data, they realised that actually these were Amura's whales. So we were so pleased to, after seeing all these whales and dolphins, to finally see uh, the Amura's whale actually here in the Solomon Islands con and confirm its identity, which was really quite remarkable. And here's mum and the, the calf going under. You can't quite see. I did have some video footage, but it wasn't working very well with the, the Internet connection. So I haven't been able to include it. Um, but you have to take my, my word for it that when you did see the top of the head, you could see just see that single ridge. And Chaz and some people were, were much closer at the back of the boat and could certainly see this kind of swirling kind of mottled skin of these Amira's whales. So they are a baleen whale. They are like a sort of miniature fin whale or blue whale. They have the baleen coming down from the top of their, their mouth to be able to gulp water and, and, and gulp lots of small crustaceans and fishes at the same time. So we achieved um, our aim there of seeing the Amira's whale alongside all these other wonderful whales and dolphins. And in the final few minutes, I just want to, to finish off with the people side of it, because of course, when you're going around these islands, it's really important to consider the people, the fact that, you know, the respect really of going around their islands and their places. And towards the end of the tour, we did, and actually we saw the Amura as well, very close to this particular island and village, um, which we stopped off at. And this is the island of uh, Kuramolum. And we got to, well, actually we got to explore a couple of villages. This one and another place where we were able to, one of our, one of our boat people actually got to show us his house and his home, meet his villagers. Um, but this particular one, we got to actually be shown around. And for me, actually, what was really special was here was that they, I guess, I guess for visitors, they, they do some of their local traditional dance, but there was something very poignant about it something very special about it that, that when I was listening to it brought real tear to my eye it was really amazing to watch and to feel welcome in this way and I just want to play you some sound which hopefully is going to come through okay this is of the women actually singing in the next slide I'll play some of the actual music oh let me just go back there again and just play that again I just clicked on the thing there And the young men were actually playing these tubes with their flip flops of all things, actually. But it was a real village experience. Everybody coming out, we were there, you know, being entertained, but also interacting with the people and seeing their kind of local tradition. And it really was a wonderful event. Here's the sound. And so oh, it's just it's wonderful listening to that music all over again. It was a very happy experience. It felt like a very sort of positive experience, really. And, and again, um, just feeling like, you know, we were supporting the community and, and, and helping to support what they are doing on those islands, really. And, and, and as I say, very vulnerable to the changes that are going on environmentally. So I'd say, you know, as part of this trip, it was fantastic seeing all the whales and dolphins. It was wonderful doing all the snorkeling. But a really important part of it, I think, for all of us was, was to actually meet real people living out there, to interact with them, not just be an observer, but to actually be, you know, meeting them, talking to them. And, and listening to that music was just absolutely uh, wonderful and, and very memorable trip. And I hope you could hear the sound there uh, without it sort of blasting too loud. I think it was... Um, perhaps a bit quieter than it ought to have been there, but hopefully you could hear it okay. And a final image there, just of the sunset going down behind one of the islands there and <laughs> actually showing you some palm trees there on one, one of the small islands. But I just can't get across how, how amazing it was just being in, you know, a very remote part of the world where you felt that, you know, technology and the kind of modern pressures of the world were, were actually quite remote, a long way away. 
and it was just quite humbling really to be able to explore the Solomon Islands to meet these people and, and just get a sense really of of how these parts of the world are and, and, and actually what the wildlife is like there and it just shows you by seeing um, 16 species of whale and dolphin just how rich those those waters are there so I hope you enjoyed that whistle top store there of the Solomon Islands and very much kind of complementing um, the trip that Sarah was illustrating there in the Komodo and the Bali Islands as well thank you Thank you so much, Ed. That was fantastic. And uh, yeah, lovely just to see some local culture and input there. So thank you for adding that music as well. Really nice touch. Um, we've had some uh, questions come in. Um, oh, Peter Pilbeam, hi Peter, is asking, can we spell the name of uh, the Amuras whale? Could you type that, um, Ed? Perhaps you could type that as a, as a reply. That'd be great, thank you. Oh yes, yeah, of course. I yeah, right and, now. Um, Amur as well. It's named after a Japanese scientist. Um, Ed, you actually made a, a really good point that I should have mentioned in my trip, uh, in my talk, I should say, um, about how you don't have to be an experienced snorkeler. And there's lots of people on hand to um, to help you. I've had a question here asking, you know, do you have to be a really uh, confident snorkeler? Do you have to have dived and this sort of thing? No, you don't at all. What I would say is you need to be comfortable swimming in the water. Um, and there are, you know, leaders, there's my, myself, um, Ed in the Solomons, and there's quite often a, a dive guide as well, who'll be in the water with, with you. Um, so I'd say two or three, sometimes even four um, crew, um, including the Nature Trek leader, who'll be with the group, which is only about 15 people, um, helping you and pointing things out. Uh, we do also encourage people who are a little bit underconfident just to, to wear a buoyancy aid, or you could even just take a little life ring and... Um, it might not seem very cool, but no one really cares because no one's looking at you. They're looking at the more interesting stuff, which is the, the coral. You can just put your arms around the, the outside of a life ring and just pop your face down into it. It's kind of like uh, it holds you up in the water and you just float and bob along. And um, either myself or someone else can just pull the life ring along and you're just getting a, a toe and uh, moving over the coral reef. It's kind of like being on a nice um, you know, glass bottom boat. I would say you need to be a, um, a happy, happy swimmer. You know, you wouldn't probably enjoy the, the snorkeling if you um, are not a, a reasonably good swimmer um, but uh, we fit you out with with fins and uh, a mask and snorkel and things like that I always recommend taking your own because then you've got had a chance to get used to them um, rather than just trying to get used to them while you're actually on the trip um, but uh, yeah I hope that helps yeah definitely I, I totally echo what Sarah said exactly the same we had some people that, that had um, very little confidence and a little experience, but actually with my help and the support of the two dive leaders plus Chaz, we did exactly what you've just said there. Started off with the rings um, and actually by the end of the trip, they, they were having a really great time and, and, and going in much, much more. And um, it didn't, you know, didn't put them off um, booking and coming along. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And particularly where the manta rays can be, they can be in slightly choppier, more, well, not choppy, just currenty water because the reason is the reason the manta rays are there is they're there to feed on the plankton, which is being brought up by all of the currents and um, churning it up from the seabed. So typically manta rays don't occur in completely still calm waters. I have seen them there. Um, but usually more often than not, they're in waters where there's a little bit of current. So if you were just to stay still and not swim, you're just going to get moved uh, gently down uh, down the reef. Um, and if you have to swim against that current, which more often than not you do have to um i you know make it my my job while i'm on the trip to uh, to drag people around the reef and i'll take you by the hand and just give you a toe and just pull pull you straight into the manta in front of the manta ray hopefully not into it um and uh, and help people out so that's you know that's what we're there for we're there to help um so uh we've got someone asking me what underwater camera i use um, and can you touch the manta ray? What would happen if you did? Okay, so um, three questions there. What underwater camera do I use? I use a GoPro Hero 5, which is brilliant. It's, um, I'd really recommend a wide angle lens on an underwater camera because when you're, um, unless you're going to have a big DSLR with underwater housing, which I don't think any client would have that's you know really professional level you want to have something with a wide angle lens so that you just need to point it in the right direction of the subject and then it will still capture it because it can be quite tricky to see the the viewfinder if you're snorkeling um 
the key to underwater photography is just get closer, get closer and get closer because the less distance you have between yourself and the subject, the better the image is going to be. And also just try and take photographs in, in good light as well. So things that are um, closer to the surface will come out better. But there's a wide range of underwater cameras that are available now. I'm quite impressed by some of the cameras I see my clients have and um, just little compact um, cameras, which are maybe sort of 200 pounds, something like that. Um, you don't need to, my, my Go, GoPro Hero 5 is about 500 pounds, I think, or was. Um, you don't necessarily need something as expensive as that. Um, I also have a selfie stick on mine. So that means I don't have to get <laughs> close to the subject. So I'm not, um, as Ed's been touching on, we don't like to alter an animal's behavior. So, so that the animal doesn't feel threatened. I'm not having to get closer and get closer and get closer with my uh, body and look intimidating I can just extend my selfie stick towards it and film it and half the time the you know the turtle or the manta ray doesn't even notice notice that it's there um, no you can't touch the manta ray uh, we ask everyone not to do that um, and don't use flash because the manta rays don't like it the fish don't like it and also it's useless because you'll get a load of backscatter with all of the plankton it'll just light up all the plankton in the foreground um, what would happen if you did touch the manta ray um, they would probably not not notice or they just swim off. Um, I had a manta ray uh, swim into me once when uh, I was actually out snorkeling and I didn't even see it and it did <clears throat> not see me. Um, and it, its wingtip just gently caressed my arm and uh, made me jump. Um, and uh, we both had a bit of a jump, but it, it just sort of swam off and didn't think uh, anything more of it. So I don't know, we don't, we don't touch the wildlife, but uh, sometimes it touches us. <laughs> Occupational hazard, I suppose. Um, Right, do we have any more questions? We had, um, Peter, you mentioned that you were quite surprised that um, the Komodo dragons were only 90 kilos um, and you thought they'd be bigger because TV makes them look bigger. This is something that I, uh, a comment I do sometimes get from people saying, oh, I thought the dragons would be bigger. And I just sometimes remind people that, you know, these are lizards. If you think about, if you've been, um, in the Mediterranean and Portugal or Spain, and you've seen little lizards on the walls and things like that. You know, this is the same family as that, but you're just seeing something that's the length of a sofa right next to you. I think perhaps because they're called dragons it does uh, contribute to you thinking that you should be facing something totally enormous. If they were just called Komodo lizards, I think people would appreciate their size uh, quite a bit more. But um, yeah, fascinating and uh, great prehistoric uh, creatures. Um, so some questions on, on other trips, not, not the ones that I'm leading because I'm, I'm dominating it now. Um, so let's have a quick look. Um, Sheila, you asked, uh, is there a chance to see Ocelot if visiting the Pantanal as part of the Big Cats of South America trip? Tom? Yes, indeed. Yeah, we, we actually visit the, the chance to see Ocelot and visit the Ocelot Island on, on all our tours to the... <clears throat> Uh, to the pan that incorporate the Pantanal and on that yeah that big cats tour um yeah I led led that tour the last time it ran in 2019 amazing amazing um holiday starting in Chile of course with Puma and then Pantanal for for Jaguars and, and a great chance of Ocelot so yeah any visits to the Pantanal we, we try and see Ocelot yeah great Brilliant thanks trip. Tom just um I think we have answered most questions just while people are wanting to type in more questions do you want to try and share your sound again oh yeah yeah I'll give that a go and uh, so we missed out on hearing your lovely Screaming bird call Peter. earlier. Yeah. Oh yeah, share sound. There we go. Can you hear it? Or yeah, what a sound! Is that sound one of the sounds of the Amazon? O often very difficult to actually see this species. It's very much a more often um, heard than seen species, but a uh, yeah, ama amazing sound. No, fantastic, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, definitely heard at that time. Great, brilliant, <laughs> wonderful call. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Cool. Um, Larissa is asking, Ed, for Canada, is the flight from Vancouver to the boat on a float plane? 
Um, no, it isn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It was on a it was on a propeller propeller plane. So it wasn't um, wasn't a jet plane like um, like you fly there and what have you. It was a propeller plane. But we um, no, we landed on a on an actual um, airfield where we then had a, a a very short transfer to the boat. I'd quite like to have gone on a float plane though. <laughs> yeah, it would be quite, it would be quite nice. I think they do land on a they do go on a float plane when um, we visit our Great Bear Lodge. Ah, um, yes. On our yeah. Great Bear um, Lodge trip in Canada as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but not for this one. It was a propeller plane, but it was it was great. I mean, it was it was a lovely little thing. You could sort of you just felt like it wasn't like a jet plane where you sort of it's so smooth but, no. it, but, it, but it, I don't mean you know it was a bad trip in this, that sense but it was just great in terms of it felt quite sort of um uh intimate and, and you're looking out the window at everything and then landed on the airfield it was great <laughs> brilliant um and uh Peter uh Sverker is asking what's the best time for the Great Bear Rainforest Ed well <laughs> when we basically kind of September time is a great time because what you're wanting to do is to time it with when you've got all the salmon basically spawning. And once the salmon are spawning, or as they're spawning, or as they're dying, they're providing all that food for the gulls, for the bald eagles, for the bears, and, and so forth, and for some of the whales and dolphins as well. And that's what you're timing it for, really. I think the problem is that if you go earlier in the year, you haven't got the, necessarily got the food source there to see the bears, really. So although they're around, they're going to be very much kind of thinly distributed around, but the fish is what's bringing them together. And so that's what we're going there to see. So I'd really suggest kind of that September time, really. You've got those young bears that are perhaps, you know, a year old or so, which are coming along with their mums. Um, and you've got other individuals coming specifically to fatten up on those salmon for the winter time. And of course, it's also a great time for the, the whales and dolphins. There's lots of food in the sea. Um, and, and that's therefore bringing lots of the whales and dolphins and the sea lions, etc. So I would certainly recommend the September time when we we mostly do those. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and you've had another question put to you in the chat from Larissa. Uh, she's asking, are those planes similar to the 12 seater Cessnas? Is that how you say that? In Africa? Just wanting to see if I'd be brave oh, enough right. to do it. Yeah, they're a little bit bigger than those. Yeah, they're not quite as basic as those. <laughs> no, we're sort you, of... have, you have got an aisle and and uh, seats on either side of the aisle. They're not just simply a, a single seated one. So the ones in, in Africa are sort of little sparrow planes and these ones are more black. These are bigger than that. They've actually, they do actually have a, an aisle where someone walks up and I think there's just like a seat either side or two seats either side, yeah. That sounds a bit better. I hope that I helps. Two I think it was two seats either side of the aisle. That's it. <laughs> it wasn't that basic. It wasn't that basic, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you all so much for your lovely, kind comments here. Um, I'm reading them all in the chat. It really means so much to us to read these comments. There's a lot of preparation that goes into putting these evenings together, contacting our, our leaders around the world, arranging dates that we can all do, especially that we're now back up and uh, leading tours again and desperate to be getting out and, uh, and operating the, our businesses. So um it's brilliant that we've just had so many people joining these evenings over the last few months and i just want to give a big thank you to, to ed and tom for speaking us our pleasure this evening Absolutely. and uh, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight at home i hope you all enjoy your spring enjoy your summer go and enjoy the longer days we have ahead of us and the lovely wildlife that they bring and we finally always appreciate your thoughts on the road show <clears throat> Excuse me. So please do let us know if you'd like to see us back on your computer screens next winter or whether you'd prefer to go out for the evening to our nearest venue that we run them at or whether you'd like a hybrid of the two um, with some in-person ones and some online. Do email us to let us know. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is running out. It's been, been a long five months of doing these presentations. <laughs> but if you've missed any of the Roadshow recordings, you can watch them on our website. You'll receive a link to this uh, in a follow-up email tomorrow. So until the next time, folks, all the best. And I know a lot of you have got upcoming trips with us. I'm seeing a lot of familiar names here tonight, and we just can't wait to get you away over the next few months. So safe and happy travels and we'll be back for another season next autumn and winter in one format or another so take care bye everyone <clears throat> bye everyone thanks for tuning in and we'll see you all soon